Oh, as we gather together, there is some technical information that most of you already know, but just in case someone does not, there is a copy of the service in the Red Book next to the door to the sanctuary. The service will be in voice and text, and worship music will be in the media player. And thank you for not touching the media player. We have learned the hard way that if you poke it, it gets cranky and the video stops playing for everyone. So if the player isn't working in your viewer, please follow the YouTube link. In today's sermon, I talk a little bit about the story of Black Kettle, which I find both inspiring and tragic. There are those who say that Black Kettle was more of a pragmatist than a dreamer. Welcome back, Little Hunt. But I still feel like this song goes a long way toward catching the initial mood for today. Don't worry, I won't leave us here.
Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to First United Church of Christ and Conference Center Second Life. We have official standing with the Eastern Association of the Southern California Nevada Conference of the United Church of Christ as a real life church located in Second Life. And I still think that's pretty cool because I have sat in South Central Pennsylvania, I've sat in Northern Maine, and I am currently sitting in Southeastern Connecticut. And I still think it's pretty cool that we can partner with my brothers and sisters all across the country and all of you wherever you are. Speaking of wherever you are, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Most churches have a time of offering. Making an offering, sharing what you can in God's name is a spiritual practice. That offering can be one of prayer or of presence, of work on behalf of the church doing things like reading scripture or serving on the board of directors, of hosting social events or being a guide, of leading Psalter or participating in church governance by being a voting member, of helping with any of the many things that are needed for the church to function, and or because this is a real church, that offering can be one of money. As a UCC church, we support the work of the wider church both with prayer and with donations, as do all UCC churches. And it's true that we don't have a physical building, but there are monetary costs for this mission to function. So if you would like to make an offering by participating in leading worship or social events, or if you would like to become a member of this church, let any clergy or staff member know. We will be accepting new members formally on Pentecost 31st. If you would like to make a financial offering to support this ministry, there is a donation bowl by the door to the sanctuary. Or, if you prefer, we can make a donation in real-life currency on our website. And, since we are a 501c3 public charity, monetary donations are tax-deductible in the United States. We thank you for the blessing of your presence and your offering of support. And speaking of reading scripture in worship, uh, Chris will be blessing us with her voice today. Jesus said, if in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but 
but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us be on our way. Thank you so much, Chris. Last week, I taught you just a little bit about the Gospel of John in general, and the part known as the Farewell Discourse specifically. I told you that I believe that the Gospel of John is centered around a theological concept that grew out of and became central to the early church many years after the life and times of Jesus. Namely, that Jesus was more than a historical Messiah, but also divine. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I told you that when I read the Gospel of John, I read it as a beautiful, poetic retelling of the Jesus story from the perspective of someone who believes. Just as I believe, by the way, that Jesus is in God, and God is in Jesus. The Farewell Discourse is the three-chapter marathon located between the events of the Last Supper and the arrest of Jesus. His last chance to have a review session of his teachings for the big test. Tell his disciples that he loves them. Say goodbye. Overall, it's a very bittersweet thing, honestly. I've always been struck by the way Jesus described giving us his peace, for example. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. I do not give as the world gives. Always reminds me of one of the most heartbreaking examples of noble peacemaking in the face of worldly hatred in the history of the United States. The story of Black Kettle. Black Kettle became the chief of the Council of 44, the central government of the Cheyenne Nation, in 1854. Which means he inherited the Treaty of Fort Laramie between the Cheyenne and the United States government, which the U.S. refused to enforce. Oddly enough, Cheyenne warriors seemed to take offense to European Americans displacing their people from their rightful land, killing their game, and consuming their water. Things devolved into armed conflict. And yet, Black Kettle attempted to make peace between his people and the U.S. government over and over again. He negotiated over and over again. He accepted treaty after treaty, even the ones that were completely and openly unfavorable to his people, in the name of peace. Only to see treaty after treaty broken. Probably the most famous example of what he went through has been named the Sand Creek Massacre by historians. What happened was this. During that time, Native Americans, some of them Cheyenne, were making raids on European American settlements for supplies, including livestock and sometimes captives who they would adopt into the tribe. You know, to replace the people who had been killed by the European Americans. On July 11th, 1864, a band of Native Americans killed a family of settlers in the middle of Colorado somewhere. Colorado Governor John Evans responded with a proclamation ordering all friendly Indians of the Plains to report to military posts or be considered hostile, and created the 3rd Colorado Cavalry. Black Kettle heeded the proclamation and went to Fort Weld, where he negotiated a peace treaty requiring his people to report to Fort Lyon and remain on a reservation at Sand Creek, which he did. And that's why the 3rd Colorado Cavalry knew exactly where they were camped. When the cavalry attacked, most of the men were out hunting. And despite Black Kettle flying the Stars and Stripes along with a white flag, they still killed 163 Cheyenne, mostly women and children. 
that. It's how the world gives. But here's the thing, that's only the middle of Black Kettle's story. He survived that monstrosity. And instead of going to war, he continued to make peace and make peace and make peace until he was finally shot in the back alongside his wife while fleeing from yet another attack. I do not give to you as the world gives. Despite the fact that I'm reminded of that tragic piece of history, it is still true that aside from the prayer in which Jesus asks God to watch over his followers so that they may all be one, is the motto of the United Church of Christ. I think this is my favorite passage from the entire discourse. The first thing about this passage that gives me joy is the statement, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not if you know what's good for you or if you understand that this is the right interpretation of the law. Or even because you've seen the miraculous signs I have given you. If you love me. And it's worth pointing out that the core of Jesus' commandments is love. I know you know this, but I'm going to say it again anyway. It's just that important to what it means to be a Christian. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Answer, do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It really is just that simple. And yet, the disciples are constantly depicted as not quite getting it. Okay, let's face it, humanity in general, even Christians, have a long history of not getting it. Okay, let's be really real for a minute. Sometimes, especially Christians, have just not gotten it. 
It's like we need Jesus right here to hold our hand. Because otherwise we'll hit somebody with it. But he's not here. He went to be with God. We're trapped here on this overpopulated and straining planet with a bunch of people, ourselves included, who just don't get it. And Jesus has gone away. But you know what? Honestly, by and large, I feel at peace. What's my secret? We're not actually alone. I learned recently that in the time and place that the Gospel of John was written, the term orphan was frequently used to describe a disciple without a teacher. So when Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned, he doesn't mean that his disciples will always have living parents. He means that we'll always have a teacher. He goes on to tell us that our teacher will also be our advocate. Someone who is even more than a teacher. Someone who will stand by us and pull for us and guide us. <laughs> I'm so excited. But I'll wait to say a whole lot more about who Jesus is talking about for another week or two. Because as with most of these important things, there is a holy day. Holy day. Holiday. Specifically for the Advocate. Until then, let me point this out. Jesus said that the Advocate will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And I find that exciting, because it means that there is more to learn. It means that our understanding of what Jesus taught us not only can, but should grow and evolve as we learn more and more about both creation and creator. It's not static. God is still speaking. God is still creating. God is still building on what has gone before. And that is so, so exciting to me. And it gives me hope. And it helps me hold on to that peace that Jesus gave us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. What do you say? Amen? I can't think of a better portrait of love and peace beyond that which the world gives than this song by Billy Joel.
some red army town served out his time became a circus clown the greatest happiness he'd ever found was making Russian children glad the children lived in Leningrad the children lived We have come to our time in worship that I really do believe is the core of what we do here together, and that is where we uplift our joys and concerns with one another in prayer. And so I would like to invite you to enter this time of prayer with a sense of reverence. We're about to enter into a conversation with God, and that shouldn't be done lightly, but rather with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Please type your prayers into chat, or if you need to use voice, simply emote raising your hand so everyone can have a voice. And as we pray together, you may wish to respond to others with words like, God, hear our prayer, or with any other words the Spirit leads you to use. Well, and I would like to start uh, because today happens to be May 21st, and uh, about this time of day, um, about nine years ago, Emmy and I were probably settling in... Was that Econo Lodge the first night? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but we were married, and we were happy, even if the Econolodge wasn't so nice. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm grateful for, um, nine years of marriage. Uh, thank you. Um, and so, uh, uh, prayers of thanksgiving for, um, partnerships new and old. Oh, God of partnerships. Hear our prayers. Jeremy, there were a lot of jokes along that route <laughs> between here and there. Uh, with Daisy, we pray uh, that God's healing presence to be upon her because she's feeling sick right now. Oh, God of healing, hear our prayers. Oh, dear. And with little, we pray for all who knew and loved her friend uh, who committed suicide on 16th, 17th. Um, there's a lot of um, difficult mourning ahead. I know that God is with all of them. And oh, God of mourning, 
hear our prayers. And with Taraxi, we uh, pray for the spirit of wisdom to be uh, upon her, um, a prayer of guidance and wisdom for life's path. O oh, God who calls us to new ways, hear our prayers. Oh, dear. I wish that... Well, I guess it's becoming less common, but it's still a common story, and I just find it heartbreaking. So I will expand that prayer to say um, that I pray the spirit of wisdom be upon uh, our society so that nobody else may be disowned for their orientation. O oh, God who loves us, no matter who we are, hear our prayers. Uh, with Sally, we pray for her crew and uh, a series of unfortunate events. Um, I will, uh, yeah, I can't say it any better than that. May you stop breaking heavy equipment. <laughs> Um, oh God, who uh, guides us, <laughs> hear our prayers. Uh, with Jeremy, uh, we pray for uh, patience um, since uh, uh, things um, are, uh, are being difficult at, uh, at SOS. Um, we pray uh, specifically for uh, trolls that they find uh, some a better way to get the attention they need. Um, oh God of patience, hear our prayers. Uh, with Doug, we pray for a friend Sharon who is heading home to New York with her husband John from Florida uh, when they had to stop and go to the ER near Philadelphia. Uh, twisted appendix. Oh my goodness. I had surgery last night. Um, and her husband can't be with her because of the um, coronavirus. So uh, we pray that God's healing presence be upon them and that they may rejoin each other soon. O oh God of healing, hear our prayers. Oh, intestine. Well, I wouldn't want that twisted either. God knew which part it was. It's okay. Uh, with Aaron, we pray for uh, mom and daughter who are going back to their jobs next week. Oh, my goodness. Daughter will be living with mom for the next month or so, and I would miss her and worry for her, too. Oh, God of um, wisdom and health and um, concern, <laughs> hear our prayers. Did I miss any of the stated prayers? All right. Well, if there was a prayer inside of you that you couldn't quite get out, it's okay. Because the psalmist tells us that God knows what we are going to say before the words can even form on our tongues. And so we know. We know that God has heard our prayers. Those typed into Second Life chat, and those spoken only in the silence of our hearts. And that we pray them in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have done a lot of talking. Let us take a moment of silence to listen to what God might be saying. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Rider of the ancient heavens, we find ourselves looking up, though we know you are with us by our side amongst us now. We look to the old stories that our ancestors trusted, and we find new meaning for our lives. May we remember our roots. 
Though we know the earth is round, may we still sometimes look up in awe and wonder at the works of your creation. May we still seek the skies as our ancestors sought other gods and then learned about you, knowing that you are more awesome, more amazing. May we still tremble when we consider all you have made, all you have done, and all you are continuing to do in our lives. For as the ancient psalmist declared, you ride across the skies, you provide for the needy, you marched before our ancestors in the wilderness. You are the father of orphans, protector of widows, and provider for those imprisoned. You are our God, ancient and holy, you as the day. We hold you in awe and wonder. Amen. And now, it really is just this simple. God loves you. So don't forget to be good to each other. Go with God. Go in peace. And amen. And we certainly uh, have added our uh, spiritual energy to that prayer. Thank you, Aaron. When I discovered the following song, I looked at Emmy and said, I think I might have been a punk in another life. <laughs> the whole thing is perfect for today's service, but I especially wanted to bring your attention to this lyric. This is a plea for peace. To the oppressors of the world and to, to the leaders of the nations, corporate profit takers, to the everyday citizen, greed, envy, fear, hate, the competition has to stop. When you see someone down, now's the time to pick them up.
Thank <laughs> you. 